So my name is George Ree. I'm a physics and astronomy professor at UNLV. My training is in fact in astronomy. And a few years ago, I switched my research to uh, climate change and working on two aspects of the problem, one of which was trying to answer the question, what would it take to switch Nevada's energy use to renewables by 2050? And the other one dealing with the issue of water use and uh, rather water supply from the Colorado River. So I've been interested in the problem from those two aspects, and I'd like to focus on the former, which is the energy use in Nevada and what it would take to switch Nevada entirely to renewables by 2050. And so there are two other aspects of the problem that I want to begin by addressing since in a timely manner we're dealing with the COVID crisis right now. And in the COVID crisis, we see, in, in my opinion, a sort of dress rehearsal for climate change because climate change is going to, as bad as COVID is going to be, and it is going to be bad, climate change is going to be even worse. The potential for more damage, more harm and suffering is much greater for climate change in the long run than COVID. And we see some warning signs of the way the COVID-19 crisis was addressed in this country as a sort of high-speed version of what's been going on with climate change, namely this, is uh, the first thing that happened with COVID-19 is they said, well, it's a hoax. So you can decide who the they is, but there were certainly elements in the federal, the current administration who said that, and elements in the media. And so it's good to know the denialism arguments in order to address them. And so the first line of defense is it's a hoax. Second line of defense was, uh, meaning an argument for doing nothing, was, well, it's a minor issue and there's no cause for alarm. Then the third line of defense as an argument for doing nothing was it's under control, nothing to worry about. And the fourth line of defense was, which is not exactly a line of defense, but sort of an excuse, is, well, now it's too late to do anything. And the final line of defense is, it's not our fault. And I've sort of presented these arguments in a certain order, but they actually uh, are made in any order. I don't think anyone at this point is saying it's a hoax anymore, but that was being said in February and, and as late as uh, mid-March, not that long ago. So, uh, but you'll hear ver various versions of these arguments being made. And so it's important to know that these arguments resemble the climate denial arguments. They're in fact exactly the same arguments. And so, but the best way to decide what to do is, and the, the, the urgency to act, is to decide whether or not you're in an emergency. And that is a sort of mathematical argument that was presented in the journal Science for making the case as to when you decide that you're in an emergency. And so I thought I'd go over those arguments because I'm a quantitative science. I like to scientist, I like to deal with numbers. And so the mathematics of an emergency, I, I have all these references if anyone's interested, but the idea of an emergency is if you quantify it as a number, it's equal to the product of two other numbers, risk times urgency. And so uh, insurance companies quantify risk as probability of an event times the damage caused by an event. If either of those numbers is high, then there's a high risk. And so you might have a low probability, you know, a nuclear power station might blow up, but the probability is very low, but the damage would be incalculable, as in Chernobyl. And so, or you could have something more mundane, as you know, you might get in a, in a car wreck, you know, and the probability is somewhat higher, the damage is less than a nuclear power explosion, power plant explosion. But anyway, the risk is probability times damage. But the emergency is the risk times urgency. And so the urgency is determined in the following way. It's the reaction time to an alert divided by the time left to avoid a bad outcome. So if your reaction time to an alert, to being told something's going on, we need to do something, is much higher, longer, than the time left to avoid a bad outcome, you've lost control of the situation. That's essentially what happened with COVID-19. Our reaction time was measured in months, but the time left to avoid a bad outcome was measured in weeks. So we were off by a factor four or five in our reaction, and that's how we lost control of the situation. We did not react in time. And what we need to do is learn from that to avoid repeating this tragedy with climate change. 
and waiting until it's too late to actually fix this problem. We need to fix this problem now. And so that's sort of the, the mathematics of an emergency, when you know that you're in an emergency and you have to act. But then the next thing is, what, what should we do? And so I looked at, the, uh, at Nevada and the IPCC recommendations for the world, actually, and the idea is we need to get entirely off fossil fuels by 2050. So we need to get the world off fossil fuels. Now, I'm not the world. I'm a guy sitting at home. Not much I can do, but I thought we can all act within our sphere of influence. And so we as scientists, I think, need to get out of our laboratories now because precisely we are in an emergency. So we, it's not good enough, I think, for scientists and people to sit at home and say, well, I think this and I'll send an email to someone. We need to demand a seat at the table to say we need to be heard and we need uh, policymakers to act on our decisions and we, ca we can't afford to be silent anymore. And so I thought one scale on which I can act is my own town. So I've tried to be uh, proactive in Boulder City where I live uh, by serving on a utility advisory committee that I helped create and also uh, switching my teaching to renewables and making a, an energy calculator to try and show people what it would take to find their own solutions to the problem of how do we get Nevada entirely off fossil fuels. About 85% of Nevada's energy usage currently is from fossil fuels. And we need to get that to zero by 2050. It means very dramatic changes. And so, and again, the COVID-19 crisis has shown that we can make dramatic changes when we think it's important enough. So it's important to convince people that this climate crisis warrants action, you know. And so my role as a quantitative physical scientist was the idea is let's quantify the problem and view it as an energy supply and demand problem. What we need to do is, first of all, reduce our energy demand as much as we can, at least per capita. We can't control how many people will be, say, in Nevada by 2050, but most likely more than there are now. So the world population is growing, there'll be more people, but we need to reduce their per capita energy demand, then estimate what the energy demand will be in 2050, and then see if we can match up with renewables. So that's kind of the logic of it. And so the calculator that I created had supply and demand options. So, and there were 10 choices on each, each side of the equation. So for example, for renewable energy supply, there are various flavors of solar energy. There's rooftop solar as an example, photovoltaics. There's also utility scale photovoltaics, big solar plants in the desert. There's uh, concentrating solar power, which are these mirrors that reflect up to a molten salt container on top of a tower like we see at Prim. And the molten salt is used to heat water that drives a turbine and then you can generate electricity. So there are various versions of solar energy. We have geothermal energy, we have wind, we can also import renewables from other states. Wyoming has a large uh, wind resource that they could export down to California and we could get some of that. There are various ways to do this. And so the idea is, in other words, there's no unique way to get from here, where we are at 85% fossil fuel usage, to where we want to be, which is at zero. There are various pathways to get there. And so then it turns into a political problem. And in the political arena, what you see is people like to say no. They're very enthusiastic about what they don't want. And so the idea of the energy calculator was to turn the debate around and say, don't tell me what you don't want, tell me what you do want by making choices and saying, can I make energy plans that add up where the supply and demand side of the energy equation for Nevada match up and we've solved the problem. So, uh, and basically in a nutshell, the, the three main sectors of uh, society where we use energy, we use energy in buildings, commercial, residential, you know, buildings for heating and cooling, for uh, electric appliances and so on. And so that's one of the main energy uses is in buildings. And then one, uh, one other main sector of energy use is transportation. We need to move people around, we need to move goods around, so we need transportation. And the third one is industry. We make things, you know, have people build and make things, and in order to do that, it takes energy. So what we need to do is 
use less energy in all of those sectors. And then once we've decided how we can be more efficient in using energy, switch, electrify everything. So the transport sector needs to be electrified. For example, for driving cars, we need to drive electric cars, not fossil fuel cars. Hybrids aren't going to do it. You know, if you have the gasoline use, say, in a hybrid or reduce it by, you know, 30 percent, but then your population increases by 30 percent, you've gone nowhere. You haven't, your gasoline usage remains constant. So that's not going to solve the problem. So we need to really look at electrifying everything so we're not using any fossil fuels, no gas, natural gas, no coal, no petroleum, no, uh, you know, anything that, uh, fuel oil, jet fuel, any of that stuff. It needs to be zeroed out. So, so the idea of this calculator, which is at uh, nv2050.physics.unlv.edu, and I encourage you to try it if you have the time, to actually see if you can come up with your own energy plans by 2050 that actually balance. Now, of course, even once you've done that, you say, okay, mathematically, we've shown that this is possible. There are going to be objections. One of the objections is costs. I think that objection has gone out of the window, as far as I'm concerned, in the last month. I think to fix the COVID-19 problem in the United States alone will probably cost on order of $10 trillion, I would guess. And that's about the number that it would take to switch us to renewables. So if people tell you, well, we're not willing to actually spend the money, we can't spend that kind of money. It's just, you know, the national debt, whatever the arguments are. We're doing it now. We're spending precisely that kind of money. The amount of money that we're spending, we've started with $2 trillion, but that's not going to be enough. We're going to have to spend more. It's mathematically impossible to keep, to sustain people who are sitting at home doing nothing without writing them checks so they can pay for food, pay their rent, and so on. And so we're going to have to spend that kind of money in the United States. And so now we have a case study of how much we're willing to spend when we think it matters. So costs are really not a problem. Secondly, in a state like Nevada, in my hometown of Boulder City, we actually make money from renewables. We rent out land and we pull in $15 million a year from renting out land to solar companies, which actually um, pays for half of the city budget. So actually it costs us nothing. And we export 20 times as much electricity as we actually use in the city. We're a huge exporter of energy in Boulder City. It works for us, we make money. We're in Nevada, other Nevadans could do this too. The other problem is fluctuations. How do we deal with the fact, for example, I've studied Boulder City, so I go back to that example, but in Boulder City, half of, which is mostly residential use with some commercial use, most of the energy, half of the energy is used during daylight hours and half of it is used at night. So the solar energy pattern doesn't match exactly the usage. Of course, there's more sun in summer, and that's when we use most of our electricity because air conditioning is the number one use of electricity in Boulder City. But it doesn't match. You know, in April, we have a comparable amount of sunlight, but there's no demand, and so we're overproducing. So what you need is to match. Now, the problem is the electric grid, as we've designed, it cannot store energy. And so we need to redesign the electric grid in order to store energy. And we're designing solar plants with batteries, so that's one way to do it. We could have people have Tesla Powerwall batteries in the house. They're still very expensive, but they're going to get cheaper. All of this stuff is getting cheaper. Solar power is, being, is so cheap now that solar without storage is cheaper than natural gas. It's coming in at 1 cent per, 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour, I think, something like that, which is a lot cheaper than natural gas currently. The other problem is land use. So people who don't think quantitatively say, well, we can't sacrifice the land, you know, there's a desert tortoise, there's plant, but the amount of land that we would need to sacrifice, and it is a sacrifice, I mean, you can't use the land for anything else if you build a solar farm, would be about a third of 1% of the land area in Nevada. Nevada is about 300,000 square kilometers. You need about 1,000 square kilometers in order to, to generate the uh, amount of electricity that it would take to power Nevada on renewables by 2050. And 1,000 square kilometers is 400 square miles. Sounds like a lot, but it's a third of 1%. If you look at the land area of Boulder City on a map of Nevada, and you think 
all the other land we can use for whatever purpose we want. Imagine going to Railroad Pass, for those of you who are in Nevadans, and thinking from Railroad Pass, you know, that casino there where you go to Hoover Dam. From there, all the way up to Idaho, you wouldn't need to use any of that land. It's the land between Railroad Pass and essentially the land in Boulder City is what you'd need to use. So, uh, so that's basically my story is, you know, yes, there are problems with costs, there are problems with fluctuations and the land use, but all these things can be addressed. And the solution is to think quantitatively. So I hope I've sort of piqued your interest to go to NV2050, try the calculator for yourself. And if you have questions, please feel free to talk to me. I've put this thing free online. I did it of my own volition. I hope that people use it. And I hope that it pr helps promote solutions to the climate problem so that we don't wait until it's too late and find ourselves in the same jam that we're in with COVID-19. COVID-19 is a dress rehearsal. Let's not make these same mistake again. We've made it once and we're paying a price. So thank you.